Anyway, thank you very much for being here to participate uh, in this great event again this year and also sharing an interest uh, and really a fascination with this whole subject and what took place on these very grounds uh, 250 years ago or so. Um, it was very significant, obviously, to the building of our nation, and our nation, obviously, is probably the most significant nation uh, in world history. So what happened here in making that nation possible, or the genesis of it, is, is very, very important. So this, all this history is uh, um, fascinating. Um, just, could we tone this down just so there's really an echo? I don't know if it may, here, it's coming from me standing in front of the speaker. That's it, that's it, that's my problem. <laughs> um, if we could, uh, uh, I will introduce, and again, our panel here, obviously they're speaking, so uh, you should uh, know them anyway, but obviously uh, David Preston, um, William Schneider, um, Tim, um, Tim yeah. Todish, and uh, Matt Wolf, uh, all experts in various areas uh, of this particular subject. And uh, certainly, I hope here uh, soon they'll demonstrate uh, their expertise as I pose different items of discussion to them. Uh, I'm Bob Cranmer um, of Pittsburgh. I have a, uh, a farm up in uh, uh, near Cambridge Springs on French Creek and also share with you a deep interest and desire to know as much as I can about uh, this particular subject. I, I will say my one claim to fame is that in 2003, on the 250th anniversary of Washington and Gist trip down uh, French Creek, uh, myself and Tom Murphy, the mayor of Pittsburgh at the time, uh, put in uh, at the, uh, up there and uh, replicated the trip. It took us, took us three days to make it to Franklin. I ended up in the water once and uh, it, was, it was quite the experience. Uh, we had a rainstorm, we had a blizzard and uh, French Creek uh, wasn't jammed with ice but it was at, uh, almost at flood stage. So it was a very interesting uh, trip. And I will also say as we put in the water up right at Fort LaBeouf right in that area, it was a very sunny day, and we started to paddle the canoe, which I built, by the way, by hand. Uh, an eagle took off uh, from the left bank, flew right across the creek, and circled above us, and I took that as a sign that George Washington himself was happy that we were recognizing uh, his uh, exploits. We never did determine who was George Washington and who was Christopher Gist, but I fell in the water, and so did Washington, so <laughs> I'll lay claim. To that, to that part. Um, Pontiac's Rebellion, Pontiac's War, historians sometimes refer to it as Pontiac's Conspiracy. He wasn't the only leader, he wasn't the uh, uh, overall commander by any, any sorts. I mean, the land and the area of conflict was just too large and you had a whole number of different uh, leaders uh, that uh, uh, led and uh, um, caused havoc for the British for several years. Um, this was the second, and, and this is just, I want to make some commentary here just to lay a foundation for the questions. This being the second conflict, and really what uh, ended up to be four separate conflicts between the major players, which were the, the French, initially the British, the colonists who were here, the American colonists, and the American Indians. First we had the French and Indian War, then we had Pontiac's Rebellion, then we had the American Revolution, and what was the fourth conflict, I might ask? Huh? No, no. Dunmore's War and... The, the North, Great Northwest Indian War, uh, which was... 30 years after this and basically was a uh, reiteration of Pontiac's Rebellion where the, uh, the uh, Native Americans weren't so much unhappy with uh, the British, they were now unhappy with the new American government, uh, which was the same old problem. Uh, 
settlement beyond the Appalachian Mountains and the Ohio Monongahela rivers. So uh, this, this whole series of struggles for this part of the world, for this part of North America, uh, lasted for a long time. In fact, I, I have four individuals buried in my front yard in Pittsburgh that were actually killed uh, during the Northwest Indian War, uh, which was a real nasty, uh, nasty conflict, just like Pontiac's Rebellion was. So um, before I get into the details, I do want to ask a, um, a relevant question uh, as to modern times and how what we're seeing now in the world somewhat relates back to this conflict because there were things that happened during this conflict and attitudes that we read about in the newspaper today. When you hear about a war of terror, when you hear about ethnic cleansing, where one side doesn't only want to defeat the other side, they want to wipe them out completely. You heard about the Indian prophet saying, exterminate the British. And at the same time, you have British officers talking about, I wish we could just hunt these people down with dogs and, and wipe them out. So let's talk a moment. I'd ask any of our panelists to talk about the overall British commander, uh, at least at the beginning of the war, his attitude, what he did, why he was fired, and that's General Jeffrey uh, Amherst. Anyone want to talk about General Amherst, why he was famous, and why he more recently has become infam infamous? Since I spoke earlier, I'm going to turn the mic over to my esteemed colleagues here. Anyone Do you want to? I'll give her a shot. <laughs> um, as, I, as I said when I spoke uh, first this morning, Jeffrey Amherst had really enjoyed a stellar career. Uh, right up to the end of the, the French and Indian War. Uh, he was ended up being knighted. Um, just, a, you know, I don't know if I should say a brilliant tactician as opposed to just a brilliant military man. Uh, he really didn't fight in any great battles here or any of the larger battles here during the, the French and Indian War but he knew how to run a campaign uh, and run it efficiently. And so his uh, taking of Ticonderoga in 1759, it was more of a methodical approach to force them away from that, that post. Um, now, the three-pronged assault that he planned upon uh, Montreal uh, to end the war is is brilliant, really, to, to being able to take three armies and converge them on one point like that. Uh, so it was really kind of a surprise to see how slowly he reacted to the thought that there was going to be a large-scale Native rebellion. And I think part of that was just the attitude, if you look through his writings and things like that, his attitude about the, the worth of, of the native warrior as an enemy. He just did not uh, respect their abilities. And uh, I think that that's something that once he did realize how big of a conflict it was, uh, maybe it changed his mind a little bit. Uh, you don't hear a lot about what happened because he was uh, recalled to England. Uh, and Gage took over, uh, but I, 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 the early part of the war, he really he didn't hold much respect for for the native the native warriors that he was going to be facing. So, well, I guess I, I would add to what Matt said. Um, he was very methodical, very meticulous, uh, very good at organizing. But he never got out in the field much himself, especially in North America. And that may have accounted for some of his lack of knowledge about the reality of both the good and the bad that the Indians had to offer. Uh, a lot of what he 
was facing wasn't really his fault. He, he was under a lot of pressure to cut back the troop levels, to economize, to help recover from a, what was a very, very costly war, not just here in America, but worldwide. So I, th I think he deserves to be held accountable for some of the things that went on, but a lot of it was beyond his control and uh, not really because of what he didn't do or what he did do. It just was kind of an inevitable outcome of the way things were. Uh, I think we have to keep in mind the native perspective in all of this. And as each war progressively goes on, the perspective greatly changes. Uh, in the French and Indian War, we see the natives trying to uh, figure out who these relative newcomers are and how best to uh, live in a peaceable situation. And obviously, the English and the French each garnered their own support for what they thought uh, what they were telling the natives was you side with us and we're basically going to have support so that we can maintain your way of life. And then you introduce all the trade goods. And when we get into the 1760s in Pontiac uh, was sending a message of you have to take a look at what's going on. And this kind of goes back to your original comment about today's world. Um, the natives were not fighting over territory. They were fighting over their sense of identity and their culture. Because with the introduction of the Europeans, they lost much of their culture and their own self-identity uh, in the skills and the different things that they were taught. And the elders started to realize there's a problem here. And Pontiac took that up as a mantle and said, we need to stop now. If we don't stop, we're basically, and I'm kind of paraphrasing in our modern world today, we're going to become them. They are going to take us into their fold and we're not going to be uh, Shawnee, we're not going to be Wyandotte, we're not going to be Huron, we're going to be English or French based on which group you're with. And I think they were very um, afraid of that because the natives had become extremely dependent upon European trade goods. Uh, by the time the end of the French and Indian War, there are specific documentations that says the elders held counsel and basically said, listen, we are afraid our young boys don't know how to use a bow and arrow anymore. Uh, they don't know how to create things. And this is bad because they saw that as an eventual loss of their identity and their culture. And now if you think about it in today's modern times and the conflicts that are going on, it's basically a, a, a fight over maintaining one's identity and one's culture, as that's a very important part. Great. <clears throat> just to, to just elaborate on that just a little bit and go back uh, to Amherst. Um, you know, the, one of the reasons he was replaced, and Amherst, again, just to emphasize, you know, here you have this Wellington-type figure who uh, orchestrated, designed this great victory in North America, um, becomes somewhat military governor, and uh, this situation uh, is created where you have a mass uprising of the Native Americans. Uh, the people back in England weren't happy about that. I mean, they had just, basically bankrupted Great Britain winning the uh, Seven Years' War, and now they have another conflict. Uh, we don't want this. So as it grew, Amherst was somewhat blamed for it. Also, his treatment of the Native Americans as this subservient population uh, that was to be looked down upon and reviled, and also their, their way of life just not uh, fully recognized, uh, caused a lot of problems, and that's why Gage came and was uh, assigned to take over to um, put an end to this war, this rebellion, uh, either by force or by diplomacy. So Amherst comes out of this rebellion with a very stained reputation, and uh, even today in Canada, his legacy uh, 
you have his statue being removed and, and different things that uh, as he's viewed as someone who is very negative towards Native Americans in our politically correct world, as it becomes more and more, we become more and more sensitive to things like that. Uh, Amherst is not uh, looked upon uh, in a positive light as he once was. So, um, to use a, uh, a quote um, of a, uh, a diplomat, of a Native American diplomat who said, to the British, you think yourselves masters of this country because you have taken it from the French, who, you know, had no right to it, as it is the property of us Indians. So that therein lies the, the real basic cause of this conflict as they see their new supposed overlords come in and take over uh, from the French and again, as David uh, uh, so um, uh, directly uh, described, uh, not in a, in a fatherly type way, but as in a uh, very uh, uh, overseer type. So if we could elaborate just a little bit more, wh why do you think they viewed, the British viewed the na Native Americans in such a negative light? Um, militarily, uh, culturally, that they weren't worth really their effort to, to um, uh, make peace with or deal with, that they had to even pay attention to these people? Anyone? That's a, that's a great question. And you know, I think, um, think about the, the, the French in America for a moment. The French established a permanent presence in America in 1608 with the founding of, of Quebec by Samuel de Champlain. So the French have been in America for roughly 150 years by the time of, of Pontiac's war. And the French have a, a, a long track record of dealing with, negotiating with, fighting with various Indian peoples. Um, I look at some of the French, uh, the, the principal French commanders, like the officer that, that defeated General Braddock, uh, Captain Beaujeu. You know, he, here's a man who was, um, just to use a, a kind of human concrete example, Captain Beaujeu had been uh, across New France um, or take, um, take Washington's counterpart in 1753, um, Jacques Legardeur de Saint-Pierre, um, that, that Washington delivered that summons to in 1753. Um, Saint-Pierre had been as far west as like the Rocky Mountains in, in, in Canada. Um, he's been all over the place seen, dealt with all sorts of native peoples, um, fought in wars with them previously. And so you basically have like a, a class of people, of, of leaders, of officers in, in New France that because they have to, they have to, they, they know how to work with, with natives. They know uh, through, through decades of, of experience native diplomatic protocols. They know how to play the game, in other words, of diplomacy. The British really have, um, at least in the, the period before the French and Indian War, they have very few uh, individuals that, 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 that match the French at that, at that level of experience. Um, and it kind of comes back to that basic difference, I think, between the French and the British of the British being settlement-driven colonies. Um, there's also, a, the, the other dimension to your question, I think, hinges on um, the, the regular army forces that come to America in the 1750s. So in 1755, as we know, the British send over um, Braddock, and he's kind of the advance of about 20,000 
eventually 20,000 British Army regulars that come over to America. And they've, they've never been here before. They have no experience dealing with, um, with, with native peoples. Um, and the same is true for the, the French army regulars that come over here in 1755 as well. So uh, what I'm saying is that French and British army regulars in the 1750s, they often have very similar attitudes towards Indians. If you read, for example, um, the journal of um, the Marquis de Mont, one of the Marquis de Montcalm's aides, um, his name is uh, Louis Antoine de Bougainville, very, very uh, accessible journal translated into English. His attitudes towards native allies are not far removed from uh, the, the kind of bad things that Amherst is saying about Indians in this period. Um, so the other, the other thing I'll add before I, I pass the mic is, you know, we're talking about Amherst, and there's, there's an element here of just plain old hubris. You know, that the, the British have conquered by force of arms the French all over the place. You know, by 1760, they've, they've captured um, Fort Duquesne. They've captured uh, Fort Lu Louisbourg. Um, they've captured Quebec. They've captured Montreal. They've captured Ticonderoga, Crown Point, Niagara, all, all these forts. Um, and, and that's just America. <laughs> and we could go on. And so I think that there's, there's an element here that they're, they're the masters of this place. And uh, you can certainly find some British officers who, who come in with that type of attitude of, of being a conqueror. Um, there are exceptions, though. Like, there, there are British officers who, they, they come into the scene and they, they kind of quick up, pick up quickly on the lay of the land. And they, they don't exhibit that, that type of um, animus against, against Indians. And it's a difficult situation because the French, even though some had an attitude towards natives at the time, the French realized that our means were better off served if we uh, learned the culture, showed interest in the culture, and actually lived and transplanted some of our own within the culture itself. And that made native relations go much smoother for the French because on the onset, on the, onset the French were not a you know, conquer and colonize type mode. They were more in a let's go in, let's live together, and then we're going to reap the benefits of this relationship. Whereas the uh, English come in with a long reputation and record of uh, conquer and colonize. And um, I think to kind of answer your original question, um, the French were in a learning mode, trying best to learn how to uh, adapt and bring in the natives to some of their ways of thought and vice versa, where the English, they came in and when they saw what the natives were about and heard um, some of their beliefs and the way they regarded land ownership, they felt it was very simplistic, a very simplistic, childish view. And so therefore, from the onset, the English always had a uh, air of, these are just mere children, and they do not understand what the world is all about, so we're going to think for them. And throughout the whole time, they did that. And then when you get into the Haudenosaunee, they were playing devil's advocate in both, both sides because they were smart enough to realize that that's what the English were doing. And they played the game with the English all the way through because that was their best bet because they were also a culture of conquer and colonize and assimilation. And when they saw that the English kind of had that same method and mode, they played the game with the English, whereas some of the other tribes didn't like that. They didn't like being talked down to uh, and demeaned uh, 
uh, in what their, what their beliefs were. And when you go to the land ownership, they didn't have that concept because they felt that the creator, it was a divine right that they were here and the creator placed them here to take care of what the creator had made. So they didn't have that concept of land and the British just seized on that moment and took off with it. I, I think we've kind of summed it up pretty well, except one element that we haven't discussed is <clears throat> the reality of the French versus the British and their situations in North America. Uh, the British were basically penned in by the Appalachian Mountains. Their population was much more dense. They had less room to expand or to assimilate with the Indians, where the French basically had everything west of the Appalachians and north of uh, say the St. Lawrence or even south of the St. Lawrence, they had almost an infinite amount of territory where they could spread out and coexist. And I think this had some bearing on it. Um, the French, they, they built Quebec into a huge city, Montreal into a huge city, not unlike New York or Albany. But out in the rural countryside, they were not as penned in as the English uh, settlers were. And I, I think that maybe it was kind of a subconscious uh, thing, but it did have some bearing on the attitudes of the British versus the French. And, uh, you know, we can argue all day who was right, who was wrong. It's, it's just the way, way it was, as David said you read uh, Bougainville's journals, and it could have been written by Amherst himself almost in some, some passages. And you also read some of the things written by the British, uh, some of the things that Robert Rogers, the famous Indian fighter, wrote. Uh, we remember him today because he was an Indian fighter, but he's also one of their biggest champions at the time. Uh, there were people on both sides that were good and bad. And I don't mean just French and British, there are good Indians and bad Indians too. And they're all human and they were doing the best they could based on the circumstances they found themselves in. Uh, on that subject, I wanted to expand on something that Tim brought up a little bit ago. Um, I think some of the misconceptions that some of our British leaders had about the ability of the native warriors uh, as a military force um, had a lot to do with the fact that they just were not used to their types and methods of warfare. They hadn't seen it before. It was something totally alien to them, but uh, not everybody had that attitude. Uh, throughout the course of history, there are several men who not only put it into play, but they would um, promote the use of native tactics. Um, Benjamin Church in late 1600s, Robert Rogers, James Smith from here in Pennsylvania uh, could not understand why the English forces did not make a better attempt at using the native tactics. Uh, so I think some of the fact that the, the, some of the British leaders uh, didn't respect the, the natives' ability. They just didn't have that knowledge that some of these other gentlemen did. Benjamin or uh, James Smith was uh, a captive, uh, lived with the natives for five years. He understood them very, very well. Uh, when he came back and was in the Continental Army and also in a, as a ranger on the frontier, he was a big proponent of trying to use native tactics. Uh, against them. He knew that that's the way that you were going to defeat an enemy. Uh, not using, uh, you'll, you'll see time and time again, they said that linear, linear formations and mass firings are not the answer. We need to improve our tactics and improve our knowledge of, of our enemy. And a lot of people, they just, they weren't willing to do that. There was a, a great esprit de corps in the British Army, they were they were one of the greatest armies in the world, and uh, they were they were not going to let a bunch of savages uh, show them how to fight wars. 
Senator, that's perfect. Just uh, as a segue into my next question, I think something that is uh, ignored to a certain extent when we talk about these wars, again, this, the character of this war was one of such unbelievable brutality. Uh, the, the Indians literally, I, I, the American, Native Americans, when, when you have the term, take no prisoners, they took no prisoners. And, and likewise, uh, on the other side, um, uh, once that was demonstrated that this was a war of terror, that this was a war of taking no prisoners, they um, accommodated the Native Americans uh, just as well. I mean, uh, we heard about the commander who was at Venango who was um, forced to write this uh, long letter of, uh, of grievances to be sent uh, up the line to the commanders and I guess to the king eventually. Uh, after he did that, they burned him to the stake, burned him at the stake. They went, tied him up and, and burned him alive. I mean, uh, really a, a, a nasty, uh, nasty situation. But the question I have uh, for our panel of experts is, um, okay, we have the Native Americans who are taking on the British Empire. Uh, the French lost to them. Uh, as did several other countries in Europe during the Seven Years' War. Um, they start this war of terror, this war of taking no prisoners. How did they supply themselves? Where did they get gunpowder? What kind of weapons did they use? I mean, if you're going to have several large engagements against the British and you have no source of supply as far as weapons and gunpowder go, how, how do they sustain themselves? How did they, how were, able, how were they able to maintain a conflict for several years uh, with the British? How did they do it? Well, there, there were, there was a, a network of some French traders uh, early within the, the conflict that were still supporting the native tribes. Um, it was to their best interest to, to have the natives continue to hunt, trade skins and things with them. So they were willing to continue to supply them. But a lot of the ways that uh, the, the natives were able to resupply themselves was the, their method of warfare, uh, raiding and plundering especially long isolated settlements. Um, that was a way of getting food. That was a way of getting clothing. That was a way of getting gun power. That was a way of getting weapons. If you could attack an isolated farm, a small chance of harm to your own party and walk away with a certain amount of plunder, you were able to then continue on raiding throughout that. So that's a small part of it but it did allow them to resupply themselves somewhat in the field. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with Matt. Um, their culture was built around making war on their own enemies and stealing and burning and pillaging and everything. And, you know, to our modern sensibilities, that might sound kind of crude, but in their world, to their way of life, it made a lot of sense. You know, if, if your enemy has it and you don't, and you're at war, why not go take it? And that was a big part of it. And another part of it that I, I don't think we can, any of us can fully quantify, but we know that the French were helping them behind the scenes. The traders were still supplying powder and ball and other necessities to the Indians. Not, not just the things that were legitimate, but some of the things that they shouldn't have been providing them. And all of that added up to the point where they were able to, to keep things going. Uh, another factor is, you, you look at the whole Pontiac Uprising, there were only a few major battles where there was a lot of firing and fighting. Most of it was small unit activity uh, sniping, raiding, so on and so forth. So they probably didn't have a need for a huge 
supply of ammunition and powder and so on and so forth. They would pin the fort down, they would snipe at it like they did at Detroit and at Fort Pitt. But only in rare instances where there are outright pitched battles where a lot of ammunition was required. So I think, uh, you know, it was always a factor at, at the siege of Detroit, even food for the Indians was a factor. Uh, Pontiac had to eventually end up uh, forcibly taking supplies from the French that he, he gave them receipts for, but it also created some animosity between him and the French. Uh, but th they had to resort to things like that in order to su sustain the siege. And uh, it, you know, a lot of that gets lost in the more dramatic and more interesting parts of history, but they have to stay supplied and, and find way, ways to do it. And um, I think it's just, you know, one of those things that we'll never know the full truth on because it wasn't well known at the time or well publicized at the time, and a lot of it today we just have to guess at. And I, th I think Tim hit it right on the head. Uh, the French, uh, at the time, were the silent backers, so to speak. Uh, much as we have happening in history up even in, into today's world, where uh, a power, foreign power, will back another country without actually getting into battle and sending them supplies. And I think it goes down to uh, uh, just being smart, and savvy about where materials are and how much we're going to need and the natives at the time knew what they needed to do and they tried some of their tactics uh, without having to fire too many rounds at any given point uh, when they were doing some of their raids. So they were able to uh, be very smart and savvy about what they did and very calculated uh, so they could conserve what they had and uh, also be able to utilize whatever they captured or gained in the, in the raid or the battle or the tactical. Just as an item of discussion uh, and not so much a question, but just to have you elaborate on some things David already touched upon, but I think are central to this war. Uh, and again, just to set the, set the tone for the conversation. For, for decades, the, uh, the Native Americans basically kind of sat back and you had the French and the British who were occupying this area. And there was a question as to who you were closer to, who you traded with. The British and the French were always uh, at odds and uh, they were not cooperative neighbors, so to speak. And the Indians, the American uh, Native Americans, were able to take advantage of that friction between the two empires rubbing against each other. Once the French were defeated and they were gone completely, I mean, the, 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 the British shipped a lot of folks out of Canada and sent them down to, to New Orleans. They were taking complete control. I think there was somewhat of a sense of uh, concern, a sense of panic that the Native Americans, the Indian tribes, all of a sudden they realize now they're the only ones left to deal with these British. And I think that Pontiac, again, way out there in Michigan, way out there somewhat in eastern Ohio, where there were no colonies, there were no uh, uh, British colonists, um, Americans, uh, you know, felling trees and plowing the earth or anything. They were concerned about what they were now faced with. And at the same time, which was touched upon, and I'd like to maybe uh, talk about it a little bit more, is this religious revival type component among Native Americans. This, uh, the, the, the one uh, most famous Delaware prophet, he was called Neolin, about um, God gave us this land, it's your land, now you need to push these infidels out, push these British out, exterminate them, because this is our land and, and we must possess it. So 
I say all that just to let's talk a little bit more about the dynamic, the change in dynamic when the French were basically gone. Because this war starts right on the heels of the French and Indian War. It's basically an extension of it where the roles are reversed. First you had the French fighting trying to get Indian support and the British trying to get the support. Now you have the Native Americans that are really trying to get the French back involved again to an extent. So could we just discuss that for several minutes? Sure. The only thing I would add above what I said earlier is that um, the, the Treaty of Paris of 1763 that, that, that uh, cements the outcome of the war, at least for the British and the French, you know, they, they basically divide up the, uh, the North American continent and uh, there's, there's not a single Indian person who's, who's represented in the negotiations. And yet, the French are essentially ceding their claims to Native American lands to the British. So, when when natives hear of of when they get the news of the the Treaty of Paris, um, you know, there's definitely a sense of number one betrayal. How how can the French king sign away lands that he doesn't own? And number two, uh, a, a, a determination to, to defend their particular territories and, and communities. And I think we've already seen the host of reasons that, that really led so many natives in this period to, to be concerned and fearful that this new order of things was turning against them. Um, the other thing I would add about the, the religious element of this is that it's, it's, a broad, um, it's a broad dynamic that goes uh, far into the future. So in the War of 1812, you know, there's a similar type of, of parallel here to Pontiac and the Delaware prophet Naolin. In the War of 1812, we're talking about uh, Tecumseh and the Shawnee prophet named Tenskwatawa. But in, in many ways, um, the, the Indian resistance in both of those conflicts, you know, it's, it's definitely political, geopolitical, but it's, it, there's also this religious element where these, these people that are facing a, a changing world, their, part of their answer is, is, is spiritual. Uh, it's kind of hard to add to what David just said, but I'll give you a little anecdote here. A uh, long, long time ago, one of the guys in my reenactment group was an Indian, or, or part Indian, and also well-educated college professor, so on and so forth. And he told me years and years ago, and I've actually seen it play out in my studies since then, he said, the Indians weren't just innocent victims. They were playing the white guys just like the white guys were playing the Indians. If you look at it objectively, you look at the Indians that didn't like the Iroquois, for example. Whose side were they on? They fought with the French. The Indians who didn't like the Hurons or the Abnakis, whose side were they on? They were on the British side. So the, the Indians were in a different element, just the way that the Europeans were in a different element, but they never lost sight of the fact of how can I make this work to my best interest? And, you know, sometimes they won. In the long run, I guess we'd have to concede that they lost, but they weren't just naive, innocent little savages. They, they were smart statesmen. You listen or you read some of the speeches that they made at these different conferences, which were basically taken down word for word by secretaries. They're beautiful, they're eloquent, and they're brilliant. So you had a very intelligent group on one side, actually three sides, all intelligent, all very self-serving. 
And to understand any of them, you also have to understand the other two. And they all were looking out for their best interests. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that was their bottom line, their motivating factor. What is best for me as an Englishman? What is best for me as an Iroquois or as an Abnaki or as a Frenchman? When you look at it from that point of view, it, it's hard to say anyone that was right or wrong. They were just doing what they thought was best for them at the time. Um, it, it's interesting too when you think about it. A lot of times, you will you will only have part of the story. Uh, a lot of times, since a certain uh, faction is a victor, that's the side of the story that you hear the most. Um, and I think it's important that we start to bring up all sides of these conflicts whether it be the English side or the French side or the Native American sides, um, and tell the whole story, not just parts of the story. Um, it was funny when you mentioned the, the Indian Wars of the Old Northwest in the late 1700s. I, I live within, well, I work within sight of the Fallen Timbers battlefield in, in Northwest Ohio, uh, where we saw another confederation of, of Indian tribes come together uh, fighting the you know newly formed legion of the United States and they have done a really good job in the last year or so trying to tell more of the total story of the Battle of Fallen Timbers including more of the native side of things and I had made a post uh, because we're coming up on the 225th anniversary of that battle that I was excited to see the effort that they're putting into the battlefield and things like that. And I actually showed uh, a link to a local article from the local newspaper. And the emphasis on that local newspaper article was that they were starting to try to tell more of the native side of things. And I had a good friend of mine who had been a reenactor for years and, and a man that I would consider to be a historian. And he got on there right away and he said, I hate when they retell history like that. And I said, they're not retelling history. They're telling the whole story now, not just parts of it. And, and it's, it's nice to see some of that start to come out because like they said, there's there's three sides to this story, not just one or two. And, and if you really want to understand it and you really want to try to get a feeling for what was going on then, I've got to understand the native side as well as whatever I'm trying to portray or what I'm trying to show also. Uh, it's like in today's world, you can have three people see the same uh, incident happen and they will give you three complete different highly detailed stories of what they just saw took place and each one of them believes that their story holds more truth than the others. Uh, it's very difficult when you get three such diverse cultures with each of their own diverse religious beliefs and then you get that, thir that third seat of the Native Americans that have subcultures within the culture itself. Uh, and I think that was part of the problem that broke down in, in uh, Pontiac's Rebellion is uh, the natives were starting to doubt themselves. First you tell us these guys are okay, now you tell us they're bad, I don't understand, they seem like good guys, but now you're telling me they're bad guys. And it makes it very confusing, like Tim said. And uh, there is one anecdotal reference where on the Ohio River, uh, the natives would quite often, when they saw the traders coming up the river, fire their guns off in a salute. The traders were not ready for this, but what they caught on to the fact was, it was a distraction because they had uh, some scouts watching, watching the waterways so that they could send a runner ahead and tell them what faction was coming in. And one time the runner didn't get there fast enough and they had a French flag up because they thought it was French traders when it was English traders coming in and they had to get the French flag down real quick and then run up the British flag. So as Tim said, you know, everybody is guilty, nobody's really innocent and there really is no victimization, it's just each group standing up for what they believe, uh, 
and trying to maintain their culture and their way of life. <clears throat> just taking one step further to talk a little bit more about the war itself, and I want to throw a, uh, just a question out. You know, the first part of this war went pretty badly for the British. They lost, I think it was eight forts, even though um, uh, they, most of them were not that significant in size. What do you think would have been the significance, or what was the significance that the American Indian, American Native, Native American forces did not take Fort Pitt or Fort Detroit? And did the blankets really play a role in the, in, in the outcome at Fort Pitt? Open it All up. right, stop. <laughs> I can only find three references to those blankets. One is Fort William Henry, when they go into the smallpox hospital and the blankets are wet and they transmit the disease. And then our difficult friend, Mr. Abernathy, comes up with the idea, well, let's just do this, send out smallpox blankets. But it didn't happen. The third, of course, is Fort Pitt, when a kayak is up against it. We're either going to live or we're going to die. And Trent Grover talked to the kind of the same sent smallpox blankets out. Now the type of smallpox that was in those blankets would not infect because it was the you know, type of smallpox that was only transmitted to um, moisture. So if you're talking about those damn blankets, if you have more references It's a question. Than, it was a question. If we have more <laughs> references than un de toi, and by the way, we show the French did not leave. They simply stayed on their farm and their seigneuries. And if they gave something to somebody else, who knew? So the French are not really gone, just the officials. Who cares? And you answered the question. <laughs> so, are, if it's so granted, like it, one more time, does anybody really have a hard fact other than one to one? I'd love to know because I don't. My question stands. Did they make any difference? Okay. So let, let me deal with, with one of the, the things you, you asked about, and we'll talk about the, the blankets and explain what, what, what that's all about. So imagine the, you know, the, the shock today if, um, let, let's say, I, I like to use this analogy with my cadets at the Citadel. When, um, when the United States was really kind of at the height of its, of its presence in Afghanistan, um, you know, we had little outposts, combat outposts, forward operating bases all over the place. You know, if, if, if news started to trickle in that, you know, the, the Taliban had, had captured some of these, uh, these combat outposts and you know, the, the, the garrisons of, of American or British soldiers were, you know, they were killed, wiped out to a man. That, that, would, that would be, we, we would think that would be pretty significant. We, we would be shocked by that. Um, and, and so it was for the British as they digested the news that basically the Indians have collapsed virtually their entire network of fortifications across the West. Um, and again, the, the, the sole holdouts are Detroit, Niagara, and Pitt, in part because of their, their size and, and uh, complexity. Um, I think that those three places, what they ultimately had going for them was, was, um, was logistical alternatives. Um, it, it, I think it says a lot that the British were able to, they, they were able to sustain a presence out in these, these Western posts in ways that, that, that just were not possible 10 years before. Uh, so, you know, Fort, Fort Pitt, as we learned this morning, its relief comes from British forces in eastern Pennsylvania, but what are they, what are they advancing along? A, a well-engineered military road that was built a few years earlier with, with lots of, of staging points along the way. Um, 
So do I think that the whole smallpox blanket episode made a difference? No. For those of you who are wondering what we're, we're referencing here, I don't know if many of you might not know this, this story, but um, when, when Fort Pitt was under siege by natives in Pontiac's war, uh, British officers started to talk amongst themselves about how they could, how they could hurt the Indians and help to relieve the pressure on this, this fort. And so I'm kind of paraphrasing um, what, what one British officer said. Could, could it not be contrived to send the smallpox among them? Um, that was Amherst, if I remember correctly. Um, writing to Bouquet? I can't remember who he was writing to, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right, it was Bouquet. Yeah. So again, these, these characters keep popping up. Um, and... Uh, and so the story goes that, that uh, blankets from uh, the smallpox-afflicted patients at uh, Fort Pitt were, were uh, neatly folded up, distributed as, as gifts during um, a truce during this, this siege of Fort Pitt. Um, and it's, it's, it's honestly one of the most controversial episodes of um, the whole... French and Indian War era, and it's it's become a, a major focus of a lot of recent historians. Um, you know, the the big question is is this is this kind of like germ warfare? The problem, of course, with using that that terminology is that these people had no idea of microbes and and how things were were transmitted. Um, so that, that parallel, in my opinion, doesn't quite hold up um, to, to a great degree. And the other question, I think, is what you were, what you were alluding to is how do you prove the, the effect of um, the distribution of those, of those blankets? Because smallpox was raging all across America, not just among Indian communities, but, but in, um, in, in the European world for that matter, too. Um, but it's, it's, it's an incident that is certainly worthy of note, and I'll let my esteemed colleagues here add anything that they wish. Uh, if you take a look at it, I don't think uh, even if it had happened the way some believe it did, I don't think a smallpox would have had that significant of an impact in a shorter time to have an impact on uh, the battle itself or the the siege. Uh, I think sometimes and in, in Michael Burke from uh, Fort Pitt will be with us tomorrow talking extensively about some of the quirky things that happened during the siege and how they defended the fort. I think the natives just realized this is going to drag out way too long and it's more than we can chew. Whereas some of the other outposts like at Fort LaBeouf was basically a small blockhouse with a small stockade around it. Um, and to give you an idea, that's not a very big fortification, well, easy to burn. And the three that survived basically hacked their way out of the fortification as it was burning around them with an ax. So it's not that uh, much of a stronghold as opposed to Detroit or Fort Pitt. So I think the seed, they saw the siege was just gonna take too long and gave up on it. And I don't think if they had introduced the, the smallpox blankets, it would not have had an, a lasting huge effect for a long time. Because it has, to, it has to accumulate and transmit from person to person to person. And by the time it would have that much of an impact, it would have been way later down the road. I just want to say one, one thing to hopefully wrap this up. Whether it happened or whether it did happen, whether Ikair did it or Amherst did it or Joe Blow did it, whatever the truth is, if it was done, it was not illegal at the time. So we can't judge them by our modern morality, our modern sensibilities about germ warfare and everything. To them, it was a new novel idea. Hey, let's try this. If we can bring the siege to an end by doing this, let's do it. There's nothing illegal or 
in their world immoral about trying it. It was a creative idea that never really got off the ground. When I dealt with this subject uh, and when I was writing my book on Henry Bouquet, I, I always kind of take the easy route when it comes to a subject like that. I quote verbatim from the correspondence between the three men, General Amherst, Colonel Bouquet, and, and Ecuador at Fort Pitt. Now, actually, the correspondence that I found was that at Fort Pitt, he went ahead and did it on his own. Now, I don't think that it had any long-range impl you know, implications as, as far as spreading the, the, the sickness among the tribes, but I try to stick with what the history tells us. He said he did it in correspondence with two different gentlemen. They heartily endorsed his efforts especially General Amherst. So we know that he did it. He even says it was two blankets and one handkerchief. We know what his intent was. I don't think he got the, the results that he was looking for, but as Tim was saying, they were trying to do anything that they could in order to try to lift the siege. This is the same man who took all the beaver traps from the trader post inside Fort Pitt and place them open out on his earthworks and wrote a letter to Jeffrey Amherst saying I hope I can send you one with a native's arm or leg in it. It was war. They were going to try anything that they did. So, but in the end, if you read what they said, that's our best, that's our best interpretation. We'll let history do the talking for us. Well, since we've uh, entered into some controversy, let's, uh, let's stay there. Um, probably one of the most controversial aspects of this war, um, not so much amongst the Native Americans, but about the, uh, amongst the uh, general uh, colonial population and the British government, uh, was a group called the Paxton Boys. And uh, the Paxton boys took law into their own hands, and there were Native Americans that lived out in central Pennsylvania who apparently had assimilated, who weren't part of this conflict whatsoever, and they were attacked and killed. And uh, the uh, uh, rabble rousers also tried to go as far as Philadelphia and said any Indian, you know, only a, a dead Indian is a good Indian. So just very quickly, one of you could comment on this controversial event that even brought Benjamin Franklin uh, got involved in it. Uh, I think it boils down to the good old boys that were needing something that they could wrap their uh, hands around and, and rattle the saber for a justice cause um, to get some action. I think they were tired. They had... They had uh, a lot of uh, built up, pent up tensions and anxiety of things that may have been done to their relatives or family and decided that, hey, this is going to give us a free license and we're just going to totally take back uh, what we should have had in the first place and the natives shouldn't have been here. They should have been totally gone. And just, I think they had their own uh, political agenda and they were using the time to push that and say, well, we're just helping out Pontiac's rebellion here. We're trying to help out the cause. Yeah, um, the Paxton massacre in 1763, that's, a, that's another um, moment in, in, in Pontiac's war that's, that's very, um, very controversial and, and uh, there's a, lo a lot written about it at the time. Um, there were dozens of pamphlets um, published in Pennsylvania in the 1760s, basically people who, who either supported or justified what the, the Paxton boys had done, um, and those who, who, were, who were against them that, that said this was, this was immoral, it was unjust, these were, these were peaceable natives, many of them Christians, um, 
but that was part of this, this conflict that, you know, from 1755 until 1763, the Pennsylvania frontier had been the seat of war. And uh, as, as you said earlier, just a second ago, um, these, these frontier populations had often really borne the, the brunt of the, of the conflict. You know, and they had had um, their farms or homes torched, uh, family members taken as captives, uh, others killed in front of them. And so I think one of the most important um, things that's, that's generated from Pontiac's war is, is this kind of uh, visceral hatred of, of Indians and a, a unwillingness to have, have them as part of our, the, the, the broader British world. Okay, to, to, to conclude, I, I, I just want to make a comment and just open up for one, one final um, thought in that the proclamation of, of 1763, the Royal Proclamation, um, which had, had been held up by the Native Americans as their Bill of Rights, so to speak. Um, how true was that? Uh, was, it, was, there, was it lasting at all? They continued to hold to that proclamation on up until dealing with the government of the United States. And uh, were they double-crossed? That's a great question. Uh, the, the, the proclamation line uh, of 1763, uh, it, it's, it's a proclamation that's it's actually celebrated in, in Canada to a certain degree as, as, a, as a legal document that, that, that recognized uh, native, certain native rights. And so I think what it boils down to is this question. Was the, was the British Empire of the 1760s, you know, was it, was it a, a force of expansion in America? Or was it in some way uh, a, an empire that could have been more inclusive, you know, that, 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 that was um, looking at, the, at the, the rights, the lands, the territories of, of natives and, and trying to defend those in some way? My own, my own view is that I, I ultimately see the, the British as more of a force of expansion. Um, and ha had the American Revolution not intervened, I think that we would have seen more westward expansion, not, not just of the colonists, but with the approval of the, of the British government. Um, here's, here's just a, a few examples. In 1768, British authorities, including Sir William Johnson, will negotiate one of the most massive uh, treaties involving native lands in American history. It's the 1768 Treaty of Fort Stanwix. And what that does is that it basically opens up a huge swath of territory from New York all the way down to, to, um, to like West Virginia and, and Kentucky, honestly. Um, and that's, that's five years after the proclamation. So that's, that's certainly well, well over the, uh, the, the initial line that the British had drawn across the, the Appalachians. But I think that, I, I see the, um, I think Washington was right, that his, his reaction to the, the proclamation was that he said it was a temporary expedient. And the, the um, he, he knew that, that there were going to be other, other treaties to come. And the, 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 tr the Treaty of Fort Stanwyck is, is a great example of that. Fort Stanwix opens the floodgates for, for American colonists to, to start moving across the mountains. And that happens under the British rule, not, not under the United States. I, I think the natives felt that it was a, uh, a possible glimmer of hope that they might be able to get things back and somehow uh, coexist uh, with their European counterparts. Um, the English, 
as uh, Dave said, it's it was a stepping stone. It was like the first was the first uh, brick in the whole foundation that had to be laid as they went along in time. Because three years out in '66, uh, you had the Treaty of Muskegon, which really to some native families dealt a devastating blow, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, uh, where they had to give back what they were feeling were their own family because they had been taking captives. But in 66, the Muskegon Treaty, they had to repatriate all their captives back to the English. Uh, so that, that, that was a, a heavy blow to some of the families. So it was hope in the beginning, and then I think it kind of waned. Um. There was actually, um, in Henry Bouquet's correspondence, there was a couple um, pretty good quotes uh, concerning that proclamation line. Uh, being he was commandant out at Fort Pitt, he was kind of in charge of making sure that those rules and regulations set, set down in that proclamation were uh, adhered to. And there's a couple pieces of correspondence between some of his um, officers under his command where they have expelled hunters or squatters from areas past that proclamation line and Henry Bouquet kind of takes a hard line with these guys I want to try them in a military court and right away here comes the lieutenant governor from Virginia oh no wait a minute now wait a minute these guys are civilians and hang on a minute these guys have legitimate claims from the Ohio Company, and hang on, just wait a minute, wait a minute, and, and Bouquet still takes that hard line with him. Then the next thing you know, this guy goes over his head and he gets some new orders from General Amherst that, well, hang on a minute, you know. We can't, we can't try civilians in the military court and things like that, so even when Bouquet tried to enforce it, his hands were tied, so. So some total to sum this up, uh was Pontiac and his uh, rebellion successful? Uh, at least in stemming the tide, uh, it was not a defeat, I take it. Um, I'll tell you next time. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, uh, we're right on schedule. Thank you very much for enduring the heat, uh, but great job. Thank you very much.